Today we are going to discuss some exam scenarios on urology emergencies. Thank you for the trainee who has kindly agreed to record this session so that it will be a good revision source. Welcome to the discussion. Let's go for the first scenario. You are on call. You have a 72 year old gentleman presented with high swinging temperature to a and &E. The a and &E doctors have tried to stabilize him. In that process, they found he had hematuria when they catheterized and hence a CT scan done which showed a 12 mm stone in the right upper ureter causing hydroureteronephrosis. How are you going to approach him? So I acknowledge that this is a urological emergency. I would like to uh, straight away go and see this patient myself. I will approach him with the uh, um, ALS protocol ABCD uh, approach. Um, I would um, um, also do a sepsis, uh, sepsis 6, uh, which will include uh, giving him IV fluids, IV antibiotics and uh, O2 oxygen supplementation. Um, also, uh, this will involve uh, uh, taking um, ABG blood cultures and uh, inserting a urinary catheter for strict fluid balance. Um, I would uh, want to take a quick brief history as to how long he's had this, uh, this for. Is he a known store former from before? Any previous uro urological in uh, intervention? Detailed past medical, uh, uh, brief past medical history? Any immunocompromised state like diabetes mellitus, HIV, or uh, steroid use? Followed by any surgical intervention he has had in the past. I will then um, uh, liaise with um, uh, the microbiologist regarding putting him putting him on, on the most appropriate antibiotics. In my current practice, I give um, as per my trust protocol, I give uh, 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 some aminoglycosides like gentamicin and a penicillin-based antibiotic. If the patient is allergic to penicillin, I would uh, uh, give him uh, uh, flucloxacin. Uh, sorry. Um, fluoroquinolones um, or uh, ertapenem. I will then, uh, um, um, sorry, can I just ask, uh, you said he's had a CT scan already yeah. that showed a 12, 12 millimeter stone in the right upper ureter, yeah. uh, in the upper right upper ureter. Yeah. So I understand, uh, so I understand this is a, um, a most likely an infected obstructive system. Um, I would like to go ahead uh, and decompress the system by means of a percutaneous nephrostomy versus a, a retrograde urotheric stent insertion. Okay. I will discuss the. Sorry, I will discuss this patient's uh, options with the patient and uh, guy um, and give him some balance information leaflet regarding these procedures as well. Um, I I acknowledge that as per the Pearl et al. study. There is no uh, significant uh, advantage of percutaneous nephrostomy over retrograde urotheric stent insertion. Um, however, depending on what uh, the, the availability of these uh, anesthetic uh, colleagues, emergency theta and radiological uh, colleagues are, I would uh, like to have this done as soon as possible, favoring percutaneous nephrostomy. Okay. Uh, we will give feedback for every question then and there and uh, because it's not timed uh, you need to inc include a kind of vitals uh, scoring system like news scoring system okay. so that you will get some warning signs if, depending upon the patient's progression and okay. uh, when you are saying aminoglycoside you should say that i will review the patient's bloods to see that the renal function is good or how will you calculate the dose for the gentamicin and okay. uh, you need to say that you will review the ct pictures yourself to make sure there is no other causes for his sepsis and uh, when you are selecting between the nephrostomy and uh, JJ stenting, I am happy for you to quote the Pearl et al study but apart from that you should bring the patient factors you have brought in the factors like anesthetic availability radiology availability but patient factors are more important for example sometimes okay. patients may not be fit for a GA procedure so that uh, the only option available is the drainage and uh, the other patient factor is uh, possibility of pyonephrosis which CT can help to have a guess and in that case nephrostomy may be slightly better compared to uh, JJ stenting which sometimes may get blocked if it is very purulent urine. So bring in the patient factor as the first choice and then of course mm -hmm. the availability of radiology, anesthesia, out of hours, weekend and all other things which you mentioned. Okay. okay, so unfortunately, you have no access to the nephrostomy. What is your next step? Um, 
Um, so my uh, next uh, step is going to be a retrograde urotetic uh, st uh, stent insertion. Um, and I would like to counsel this patient and consent him as per the bowels information leaflet. Um, and um, I will proceed with proceed with that. Okay. Um, what is your interrupt steps? What equipments you will keep ready for the procedure? Um, so the instruments that I will keep ready for this procedure is um, a cystoscope, uh, a sensor wire, and a road runner um, on standby. Uh, followed by uh, um, um, uh, six French uh, multi-length urotelic stent um, and uh, um, um, four point um, four point six centimeter uh, urotelic stent, uh, along with a urotelic um, uh, axis uh, catheter, uh, some contrast, um, um, and uh, potentially uh, a, a, a rigid urotroscope as well. Okay, when you are mentioning about the stent, uh, six French is fine. The other option is just to have a standby, a four French or four point five French in that order. Uh, but you said four point nine centimeter. I I think take it as four point nine oh. French possibly. And uh, multi length is yes. fine. Any specific reason why you want to choose multi length? Um, this is what is available uh, in the unit that I work uh, in. Uh, but otherwise. Uh, um, 26 French or 24 French, depending on the patient height. Okay. You can also say that um, if it is mostly female or bit short stature, 24, while for men with uh, normal height or more than average height, 26 is a good choice. Uh, you should bring in image intensifier. That's another thing you oh, should yes. make sure available. And uh, contrast is fine. Urethric catheters are important. Cystoscopes are fine. You can say that I will try to see if there is a cystoscope with the Alberin bridge so that uh, the access to the urethric orifice will be slightly easier. Okay, so you are starting yeah. the procedure and uh, let us assume that you are able to pass the cystoscope up to the urethric orifice but the guide wire when you are passing retrograde it reached up to the stone and not passing by the side of the stone. What will you do? Um, so um, there are a few maneuvers that I can do. I can railroad a urotelic uh, um, access catheter over this guide wire um, and um, just proximal, um, just sorry, just uh, distal, distal to this uh, stone. I can then reinsert my uh, guide wire to see if this uh, bypasses the, 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 the stone uh, into the renal pelvis. Um, if I'm unable to do that, then I would like to change my uh, wire uh, to a road runner. Um, or angled uh, turumo to see if this uh, I, I can negotiate the, the stone um, um, and then on top of that wire I would be able to um, insert um, uretic extent. If I'm unable to uh, 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 manipulate uh, beyond this stone I will then uh, try to insert a urethroscope and try uh, inserting the guide wire under direct uh, vision uh, to see if this helps. Okay. And if all fails and I'm still unable to, and it's a very impacted stone and I'm unable to negotiate the stone, uh, even with using my um, uh, rigid urethroscope, that I can potentially uh, do a very limited uh, uh, lasering of this stone enough to make uh, um, um, some uh, passage so that I can pass my wire around it um, and then put a stent in. I will definitely want to reduce the uh, operative time and general anesthetic time for this patient uh, and my main priority is going to uh, uh, unblock this kidney and obviously I would not want to uh, invest more time in uh, laser stone fragmentation of the stone um, than what is necessary. Okay, a few things to add is uh, just be careful when you're saying road runner because it's very individual. Sometimes the examiner may not be a very pro road runner person and uh, okay. examiners usually have the same standard for everyone uh, it doesn't matter what is the examiner's personal wish list examiner will mm -hmm. go by the uh, keys in the booklet given to them but somehow in the booklet if the road runner is not there and if the examiner is like an anti road runner because sometimes road runner is quite counterproductive so when you're saying something very unique you have worked in various units you can see that at least 50 percent of the units they don't use road runner 50 percent they use it so these kind of things 
you should say with a kind of caution like very cautiously i will see if the road runner is useful and uh, you should exhibit that it is not something you will use always like a sensor guide wire sensor guide wire yes absolutely yes for everything road runner you need to be careful okay. and uh, okay. similarly electroscopy when you are mentioning you should say that uh, i will try to see that uh, if uh, my on call consultant is available to supervise me because uh, there is a high chance for preparation or creating a false passage with electroscopy i will try not to use electroscopy as much as possible but having said that once i expire all the modalities with my rigid cystoscopy i don't want to abandon the procedure and i will try to use uh, electroscopy as a last resort so examiner should understand that you will not just like that take electroscopy just like that use yes. a laser lithotripsy Uh, lithotripsy you use the word so that examiner understands okay this guy will not use lithotripsy unless if something fails okay yes yes how do you think the uretric catheter helping you when you are passing a sensor guide wire it is buckling under the stone not getting along the side but you said you will use a uretric catheter how the mechanism works um so the ureteric catheter is um a bit more rigid as compared to um um a, a, a guide wire uh, hence it provides local um um support um and prevents a buckling of the um of the wire um so just uh, gives it a bit more uh, physical support uh, which is a bit more distal or uh, um as compared to um which is uh, a lot more nearer to the stone as compared to using it without uh ureteric catheter yeah i mean the context is correct the way by which how you can explain it is the sensor guide wire has got a highly flexible end so because of the highly flexible end when you are trying to pass up by the side your maneuver of pushing the guide wire may not get transmitted to the end of the sensor guide wire and end is getting buckled due to the flexibility while the ureteric catheter straightens that uh, flexible part and makes the whole sensor guide wire into a rigid part re- re- reducing the flexibility in the tip so that the tip is more straightened and uh, it's more of transferability of your force to the tip of the guide wire that's what you should try to exhibit okay, okay. the um, guide wire is nicely placed uh, and coiling in the renal pelvis what is your next step um so, so guide wire is coiling in the renal pelvis um i would like to uh, then uh, railroad my uh, excess catheter over this guide wire into the renal pelvis i would like to aspirate um and see what i am able to aspirate and send that for culture it might be in uh, some pus or some uh, uh urine that might be coming out from there but uh, as um his history directs me uh, ch- chances are it's likely that is going to be pus that is coming out from there i would like to send that for culture um followed by uh, once i've decompressed the system and i've aspirated about uh you know th- you know 20 30 mils or, or maybe more than that if i'm able to aspirate more i will then do a very gentle uh, uh retrograde study um and uh, to make sure that i'm in the correct place and i'm in the renal uh, pelvis and the collecting system uh, following that i will reinsert the ure- um, the sensor wire through the ureteric catheter and take the ureteric catheter out and railroad uh, my ureteric stent um, onto this wire into the renal pelvis i will confirm the position of the uh, ureteric stent on image intensifier um and um the the top end and the bottom end uh, followed by uh, inserting a ureteral catheter uh, um and uh, finishing this procedure okay why there is a need for ureteral catheter um um uh it's so for two things number one is um to as a part of my sepsis sis sepsis sick um uh, to monitor his u- urine output and secondly to maintain a um uh low pressure urinary unit on the, the on that side well on both sides okay um during the exam there will be a paper and pencil in front of you so always any values when the examiner presents like 72 year old 
um yeah. 12 mm right upper utric stone just try to make a note of it so that you don't have okay. to ask again like psa value test dot mamaka values etc and also okay. it gives a good feeling with the examiner that you are quite engaging and you are quite meticulous with the details Uh, so okay. if you are writing those things at this point you can bring out that e 72 year old and there may be a component of benign prostatic enlargement so it's nice to keep the catheter at least for one or two days till his new scoring normalizes until he becomes nicely ambulant okay, okay. so okay. after stent placement is quite comfortable the next day you are going for your morning ward rounds and he feels much better he had his breakfast the urine is completely clear and his new score is zero what is your next step um so my next step um once he's stable uh, is going to counsel him regarding uh, his current condition i will give him some bowel info and counsel him as per the bowel in bowel information leaflet for uh, um urethroscopy and laser sort fragmentation i will ideally like to do this um in a um, uh, in a delayed setting i would like to uh, have give uh, the real track enough time for the inflammation to settle i will uh, give him a date for his urethroscopy laser stone fragmentation um and uh, safety net him um and then plan his discharge uh, remove his catheter and ask if he has any further questions and i would answer them accordingly okay the correct terminology is not delayed setting it's more of a elective setting so that you can Electricity. list him in uh, maybe like 3 uh, to 4 weeks time you should bring the alternative methods available like for example shock wave treatment but you can mention saying that uh, right shock wave treatment is one of the option but it's not ideal because he's got a stent in those with uh, stent uh, the urethroscopy may have an easy access and better clearance compared to the shock wave which is not an ideal choice in the presence of the stent so every question you should options when you are giving lot of scenarios lot of situations you will be obviously having two three options say for example if there is a patient with say 18 mm renal pelvic stone attending for a clinic for an elective treatment it's uh, eswl mini pcnl urethroscopy everything is equally good option if you see the latest nice guidelines there is more leaning towards eswl so you should mention eswl with little bit more weightage compared to the previous nice guidelines but there are some scenarios like this where urethroscopy is quite obvious first choice but don't forget the other choices and even if they are not suitable you can mention and exhibit that they are not suitable that's a way you are showing off your knowledge so okay. if three or four of your predecessors just said urethroscopy and if you are saying the other options available like eswl but i will not choose them because it's not a very ideal choice in the presence of the stent that you are awaking the examiner the examiner is getting so bored hearing the same answer but you are answer us with more quality and more answer okay okay, uh, okay. You, yeah. you're not bringing a very absurd choice like pcn okay you are bringing still a good choice upper urethric stone 12 mm stone is a very good choice but patient is pre stented so urethroscopy may be a more ideal choice okay okay yeah good can we go for another scenario yes please yes good and um, on a different day on call you are asked to review a patient in any is a 42 year old diabetic patient uh, presented with a large ulcerative lesion in the scrotum and the medial side of right thigh how are you going to evaluate him um so i uh, understand that this is a urological emergency i would like to go see this person uh, straight away i will approach him with the um, als protocol of a b c d e um i will uh, do a, a quick sepsis sepsis 6 uh, um um that have six parameters um including giving iv fluids antibiotics and o2 oxygen um and inserting a urethral catheter taking blood cultures and uh, abg i will have to do a full set of bloods for him including fpc use and ease his hp avc because he is diabetic um i would like to take a um a detail um, a quick uh, a history regarding uh, the duration and severity of his symptoms or any progression of this uh, um um uh, this this um this uh, discoloration um i would uh, then ask for any pre past medical history any allergies any previous surgeries he's had followed by a quick examination general physical examination looking at his muse 
um, his heart rate, blood pressure, temperature, um, and his respiratory rate. Um, I would then want to do a quick examination, his abdominal examination, and examination of his perineum and genitalia. Genitalia. I would like to mark uh, these uh, this um, area of uh, blackness in his groin and his uh, scrotum. Um, followed by um, look for any uh, palpate for any crepitus um, um, and want to look at the extension or the extent of this uh, black area uh, if it's going to his uh, anal color anal um, uh, can, uh, uh, near his anus. I would like to involve the uh, if that is the case. I would like to involve the uh, um, um, the surgical team, the colorectal team. Um, I would also um, acknowledge that this, this to me looks like a, a fornius gangrene, and would like to involve the IT, ITU team uh, early. Um, I would um, explain to him and uh, his next of kin uh, the the findings of my examination and uh, further treatment options, which will be a surgical debridement. I will give him bowel information leaflet for this um, as well. Okay. Um, you can bring the word phonus gangrene quite early in the discussion. The opening gambit itself, like uh, I will review this patient as soon as possible. My working diagnosis, even before seeing the patient to make sure that there is no phonus gangrene or ruling out phonus gangrene, because you have that in your mind you are approaching as if like a phonius gangrene without telling that so you can bring the diagnosis quite early so because that's what examiner also looking at so your aim is to show off your knowledge and tick all the boxes what the examiner keeps in his mind okay okay is okay. there any scoring system available for phonius gangrene um yes uh, there is a scoring system however this um, um escapes my mind right now can I come back to this question later? Yeah, so it's known as phonius gangrene severity index and uh, it takes into consideration of the individual patient parameters, blood parameters and uh, vital parameters and um, if the score goes above 9, the chances of uh, death is something around like 72% while if the score is less than 9, the chances of survival is 78%. It's, it's a very short uh, uh, para given in various resources just google it you will find it and it's quite easy to read um, what is speciality on phonius gangrene why are you so worried about this particular thing so uh, phonius gangrene is a uh, necrotizing fasciitis um, of uh, um, um, of the genitalia and the perineum uh, this is uh, rather has a high mortality uh, associated with it and um, tends to extend on the face at the on the facial planes uh, quite rapidly um, hence uh, the reason for my worry and concern okay so what may be the infective organism the infective uh, organism is normally an e coli clepsiella proteus uh, anaerobic uh, organisms uh, including enterococci okay um, the gangrene is not involving the anal canal, so you are taking this patient on your own for the theater for debridement. What is your approach? How will you prepare him before and during the procedure? So I will count, uh, consent this patient as per the bowels information leaflet. I will explain that um, the procedure involves debridement um, and he, at the end of this procedure he will lose a lot of skin. Chances are that he will be intubated and be moved to an ITU. He will need a relook uh, a second procedure in about um, 48 hours um, um, and will might result in further debridement um, as well. At the end of this procedure, I will explain that um, he will, um, um, chances are that he will have a large um, area of um, uh, debride skin and will need uh, intervention from uh, plastic surgery. Um, 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 I, I, I will uh, let the plastic surgery team know uh, that I will be taking this patient to theater for debridement and will ask uh, that if um, they can come to theaters uh, for, uh, to take a look or if they want to be involved at a later date once the inflammation has settled and that's fine as well. Um, I will um, also ca ca consent him regarding uh, catheter insertion which might be urethral or uh, uh, suprapubic or both depending on the extension or the extensivity of his uh, debridement and involvement of his, the skin of his glands, uh, sorry, skin of his penis. I will explain that 
um, um, in cases where um, fornis gangrene um, um, is involving the scrotal skin, uh, he will lose the scrotal skin as well. And in those circumstances, I can put the uh, testes in inguinal pouches uh, for temporary basis uh, till he improves and, and is seen by the classic surgical team. Okay. I will also liaise with the microbiologist regarding uh, appropriate antibiotics post-operatively and involve ITU team as well. Okay. What will be the extent of your debridement? Um, I will uh, debride um, until I reach uh, um, uh, healthy tissue. Um, so the, the extent uh, can be up till the, you know, as far as uh, the, the, the thorax, um, the chest cavity and down to the legs as well. Is there any named fascias which can prevent funis gangrene spreading? Um, the scarpa's um, fa fascia um, that um, inserts onto the supra, uh, onto the acromioclavicular uh, um, area down to uh, uh, just below the inguinal ligament on uh, on the legs. So, um, if this um, fornis gangrene is involving um, it spreads, sorry, the fornis gangrene sp spreads. Um, horizontally along this plane and can involve um, any of these areas. Yeah, just be, be very confident on this fascias. It's Coley's fascia, Scarpa's fascia and Buck's fascia. If the phone is gangrene usually will be above this fascia and once the fascia is breached, it will be quite deep and quite extensive. Fascia is usually a very nice avascular plane which uh, prevents further extension of the phonius gangrene. But if there is any facial breach, it's a uh, facial breach, so you need to be a little bit more extensive. What about uh, spread of the phonius gangrene into penile shaft and testes? Um, so penile shaft, yes, it can be um, involved. However, testes have a dedica dedicated blood supply and in extreme and is very extremely unlikely that the testes are going to be involved in these so testes are normally viable and healthy um, however penile shaft can be involved yeah you can be a little bit more explanatory the testes has got its own testicular artery supply directly from the iota in the spermatic cord which we know from the embryology so that's why the testes are nicely preserved while the local inflammation involves into the various skin and subcutaneous tissue in the penile shaft it, because of the bucks fascia the deeper structures are usually spared but when there is extensive gangrene even the deeper structures will get involved in the last three questions at one point you should bring in that you will take the tissue culture and uh, two three specimens one for anaerobic another for aerobic organisms and um, one for just staining so that you will get some quick results uh, because the culture will take 48 hours, you should bring in like uh, broad spectrum antibiotics or triple antibiotics. Uh, so you should be a little bit more explanatory showing off the extensiveness and the gravity of the ulcerative lesion. And um, you will get uh, consent including the proceed. Like for example, sometimes intraoperative, if you find something, you may have to even debride and get into more deeper structures compared to what you can obviously see outside and uh, you can bring in something like a vacuum dressings not maybe in the first sitting itself but in the second sitting or third sitting vacuum dressing as a place you have correctly brought in the involvement of the surgical team and also the plastics team that's very good and um, what are all the usual reconstructive necessities in the second or third sitting when you are exploring the patient, what kind of reconstruction you may have to consider with the plastic surgeons? Um, um, once the inflammation has settled, um, then the plastic surgical team might need to do some skin grafts to fill this um, uh, debrided area. Yeah, again, you can show some confidence in the in the dancing because it's usually like a skin graft or uh, something like a uh, fascia or uh, like a flap. 
so if it is only above the fascia then skin graft should be more than enough but if it is below involving some muscular layer if it is extensive patient may need even a local flap with a pedicle to cover the area just a brief one i don't think anybody will go quite in detail with that you can say that patient will need a bladder catheter for monitoring because the ambulation may be quite difficult in the early days and uh, you should mention about the vte prophylaxis on these situations because these patients are a bit bedridden so they can end up having the vte related complications like dvt or pulmonary embolism etc okay 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 yeah good nice two scenarios we will discuss one more scenario okay in yeah. few minutes time yes yes